Well, welcome. This is the uh, uh, one of the two last sessions of the day. I'm John Hansen. I'm the president of Nebraska Farmers Union. It's my uh, uh, pleasure to be able to moderate this panel today. And uh, this is similar to uh, several sessions we've done before where we've highlighted different counties, including Holt County, among others, uh, to just take a, a snapshot view of and a look at what uh, a very substantial investment in renewable energy, in this case wind, can do for a county and looking at it from different kinds of eyes and perspectives. So we're going to have different um, players from Wayne County. You now we've had three different projects, wind projects that are substantial projects in recent years that have been uh, put online uh, in Wayne County. And so uh, with us today, uh, is uh, we're going to start uh, with um, Superintendent Andrew Offner, uh, who is the superintendent uh, at Windside Public Schools. And of all of the different uh, players who get economic benefits and pieces of the, uh, the new development pie, schools are, and education is a very uh, substantial uh, player there. And so, uh, uh, Superintendent Offner, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So, hi, my name is Andrew Offner. I am the superintendent of Woodside Public Schools here in Wayne, Nebraska, or in Wayne County, in Nebraska. And I've been serving in this role for four years. Uh, since that time, uh, they started adding wind farms around us a couple of years prior to my arrival. But right now we're up to 123 wind farms that actually reside within our, our schools, uh, school district's boundaries. So that, that is quite a few windmills and it's significant uh, considerable amount of dollars to help support our school district. And uh, we've been very fortunate and blessed that we ran a bond, um, a bond to improve our building here at Windside and it passed. And uh, part of that was because of the um, proceeds that we were getting through the um, Nameplate tax. So it's just, it's been very beneficial to our school district. Uh, we've, we've talked to the windmill companies about how we can um, attract um, some of our students into that field since there's so many windmills around us. So what, what's the educational impact or what they will need to do to help um, make sure that those continue to run in the future, um, things like that. So I'm open to any questions or dialogue. Um, I can provide any additional information. I just know it's been a huge blessing to us here in uh, Northeast Nebraska and in Woodside Public Schools. So uh, can you, do you have any other uh, kind of impact information that you want to share with us in terms of kind of the, the uh, we, we know there's an impact, but what the size of the impact has been? Yes, yeah, so um, I've been measuring it over the years and we've been estimating um, this year, I think we'll get end up getting like six hundred seventy-five thousand dollars off the nameplate capacity tax. Um, we have three projects that are in our district. The first one is the Shoals um, Wind Farm. Uh, the second was Plum Creek, and the last one is Haystack, which went COD last year. So once those are the uh, Haystacks fully integrated and online, and we start receiving payments from them. I believe we'll generate somewhere around eight hundred and forty thousand dollars of tax revenue from that, and that doesn't include the amount that we got in evaluation because of the commercial impact on our on our district. I believe that was we got a twenty five million dollar bump this year to about seventeen, so about forty to forty five million dollar valuation impact to us uh, commercially, because we're a rural district and we don't have a lot of commercial valuation. So uh, we'll open this up to questions. Uh, so if anybody has questions, please let me know and I can repeat those uh, for the superintendent. So the question was asked, uh, how well received uh, has this, uh, have these wind farms been uh, received in the community and sort of what's the feeling in the part of the district? So um, there has been a lot of negative feedback on the, on the wind farms themselves. Um, they've all been very good about delivering what they said they were going to as far as whatever payments that they promised people or the contracts 
have been executed between the landowners um, and the company themselves. So that, that's always been very good. They were very good about helping out with any projects within the county. I know they helped out our uh, EMS, which I'm a part of too. Uh, they gave dollars to help so we could get a new ambulance. They donated money to our FFA program for us to get started here in Windside. So those were all positives that we got from uh, the actual companies. As far as, I mean, I've heard a couple of negative comments that people don't like seeing them, obviously, or walk out their door and be staring at one. But besides that, it's not been bad at all. They were very, very good to work with as far as when they were putting them in, busing routes for us. They were very, they, they tried to make sure that they weren't running trucks during those times so we wouldn't experience any delays. So they worked very well with, that, with us on that as well. So something I thought I'd actually hear a lot more about during this conference was just labor going into this sector and how many technicians are going to be needed. I work at a K-12 school district and we just keep hearing about solar technician and all these types of technicians being, you know, a huge need of the future. So I'd be curious from your perspective with a K-12 school district, how you're connecting that to curriculum. I'm sure we'll hear from Northeast Community College as well, but just (laughs) at young age, how are we going to start getting students interested in these careers so that they're able to fill such a huge need in the future? Um, so with us, we, we've been approaching it, working, trying to work with Northeast Community College on what courses they would offer so we could provide that list to our students that are showing interest in the field. We haven't got a new CTE building built yet. So once that's completed, we want to work on bring a partnership um, with with the wind turbines so we can bring some of those hands-on experience to our kids and then that way that we can kind of entice them into a job that's around here and now i'm trying to remember the number of technicians they have for each um since there's three separate projects i believe there's at least five uh five at each project so we have uh, 50 new jobs in the area i could be slightly off on that but I know it, it is an increasing uh, field. So that's that's the information I have. So relative to the, the, the prospect of taking advantage of our really successful wind technician training program uh, at Northeast Community College, uh, there's also the, uh, the opportunity when you have wind turbines in the neighborhood to take another look for kids who are uh, in, who are students about what kinds of career options are possible. So have you had any, uh, have you seen any kind of uh, correlation between the, the wind turbines and people looking at meteorology or engineering or the whole host of other kinds of careers that are tied to this industry? So I, I know I can speak um, with the conversations I've had with kids here at Windside and my own children um, I know I was just taking my son to uh, an appointment yesterday, and he was asking, like, well, what would, what would it, what could you do to make the, the windmills more efficient? He goes, could, is there a way that you could make them weighted so they produce more electricity through, through the actual turbine itself? And he's a freshman, and I know we were having some conversations about that. So I know there's kids that are interested in, in the inner workings on how they work and how to increase their efficiency. So, I mean... Those are, those are good conversations to have with kids. And I know I've had that with several other kids and encourage them to look at the program at Northeast so we can keep them local. Cause I like to keep our kids, if we can, coming back to our, to our local schools and benefiting our local economy. And so do you, do you view this project as a superintendent as uh, a plus relative to you? And I know that you have goals for your school and your school district to try to help give kids the, the, the desire, but also the tools that they need in order to be able to uh, come back to the district and uh, be there as adults and raising their kids and staying in the district and growing the, uh, the population and the economic base of your district? So I see this as a plus because it's a technology that um, can be learned about, it can be replicated, um, it, it's, it's renewable, so it'll be around for a long time. So I see that that is a benefit both financially and um, educationally for kids and um, the potential to attract more people to our district to live here if they're working for the, for the wind farms or 
or however it is, but I, I see it as a plus um, on both sides. Um, and I know we're, we're early into this, but I, I do want to continue to build on those partnerships to get kids interested in it and, and get them the career, that career path. Well, thank you very much for your participation. And you can hang around uh, if you would like uh, for the next uh, while, while we finish the, the other panelists. But uh, we thank you not only for your participation, but based on the total number of wind turbines that you have in your district and the impact that has had, we would also uh, wish you our sincere congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invite. And if anybody has any other questions, just let me know. Very good. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. And now let's move to uh, Luke Virgil. Uh, hi, my name is Luke Virgil. I'm the executive director at Wayne Area Economic Development in Wayne, Nebraska. Uh, we serve chamber economic development and Main Street programming for our community and the surrounding area. Uh, I started the job in September of 2017. And right at that same time is when they had kind of laid out the announcements for the Shoals Wind Energy uh, project with Nextera. Uh, so I got to work from the very beginning of my career with the idea of wind as a economic development tool. Uh, they put in the $250 million project with Shoals and very shortly on their heels came Plum Creek with a similar size. And then just in the last year and a half, the Haystack project went through construction and I think they're online now. Um, again, another $250, $300 million project for the area. So we're looking at over 200 turbines in the county, uh, close to probably $750 million worth of investment between those three projects in the area. Tons of contractors, subcontractors coming through, staying at our hotels. Uh, a lot of new, you know, that, that temporary workforce was tremendous. It was split between the different re areas of the region. Wayne saw some of it. A lot went to Norfolk. I see Mayor Moaning in the back. I'm sure they can talk about their lodging uptick and some of the uh, equipment and things that came through their community. Randolph saw a lot because they were closest to the Shoals site. Um, and so we, and of course, Windside with where Superintendent Offner's at, they were, they saw a lot of activity as well. Um, but this has been, it, it starts really, really, really vague because nobody knows who, who this company is. You, you start hearing about landowners that like Don that are getting locked into these contracts. And then suddenly there's this explosion of activity, activity, um, the Haystack project, it was very visible. Uh, it was right along highway 35 West of Wayne, about seven miles West of Wayne was their laydown yard. And it was incredible to watch them bring in all the equipment, all the materials. And it just, they filled this hillside. And then just here in the last six months, it disappeared. Uh, yes, the project was done, but it's very, it's very fun to see how quickly they can clean up that site and get it back to a field where they can do farming again on it. And it's the same thing for each of the turbine locations. Everybody comes in, they get it all set up. You know, you put your wire in first and then they start building the tower and suddenly it's back to an arable field because they save all the topsoil and then lay it all back onto it. So for the landowners, it's a lot of impact for a short amount of time. And then it's a very minimal impact over the long term. Um, for the community, we've, we've, we still don't see a full impact like Windside. Uh, Wayne Community School District had only one tower in the Shoals project. I think in Plum Creek, we had zero, but Haystack were somewhere in the 20 to 25 range for actual turbines. And that's what impacts the actual, you know, the nameplate tax for the, the district and the county as a whole with over 200, they're seeing a big impact there. Um, I wanna say, uh, was it 20 to $30,000 a month in, in new nameplate tax in that, in that first year for the next era project. And you compound that over the other three, it's, it's gonna have a, a big impact long-term. Um, uh, I think it puts us on the map. Uh, so when you look at who the companies are that are buying the power from Shoals or from Plum Creek or Haystack, these are major companies from across the world. And a lot of it's being channeled through like Omaha, Omaha Public Power District. Um, I remember when the NL project happened over in Dixon County, just to the east of Wayne County, there was a lot of chatter because Facebook, one of the most high profile companies in the world was involved in that, the power purchasing agreement. Uh, so the, the, that it puts Wayne County on the map because you've got clean energy coming from a, a very remote part of the world. 
but it still is affecting projects that are happening across the world. Um, and so I, that's one thing that I take away from it. Uh, with that, it gives you the opportunity to have other stuff come down the pike. This is something that uh, my friend Phil with NextEra and I talk about. It's something I welcome with Orsted as the other major investor in the community, in the county. You know, what other things are they needing in the, in the future and how can we be a player to help them achieve those goals? You know, we talked a lot at this conference about solar and a lot about batteries. I'd love to have both in Wayne County. And I think since we don't have zoning in Wayne County, it makes it more, more achievable than maybe say up in Cedar County or Pierce County or Stanton County, which is surrounding us on, on three sides. So when I talk to my, uh, some of my buddies back home in Neely, and I say, well, what what does it you know mean for Neely uh, to have all of these projects? And one of the things that they said was, gee, you know, uh, we just kind of never thought about that. But you know, we've got fifteen to twenty young professional people in Neely uh, who are you know well paid, good paying jobs. They're uh, you know they're they're involved in the community. They're involved in uh, you know, the volunteer fire department, they're involved in, uh, you know, being first responders, uh, they're having kids, they're sending kids to school. And they said, you know, for, for us and a town that size has been kind of a jolt, uh, but a very positive jolt. Have you seen uh, the beginnings of that, that, those kinds of things in, in, you know, the communities in Wayne County? In Wayne proper, not as much. And that's mostly because of the geography. Most of the turbines are further west in Wayne County. Um, and like I said, we don't have as many in our Wayne Community Schools District, not anywhere near as many as what uh, Superintendent Offner has for Windside. Um, and a lot of those employees, they live closer to those wind turbines because some of them need to be available at a moment's notice. And all of the collection substations and the control booths along with those substations are located in that western third of the county. Um, but having them in the county is is really important. I mean, it's it plays into what, what Nate, uh, Nathan's going to be talking about with what they've got at, at Northeast. Um, th these are great jobs. I know several years ago, the wind tech job field was one of the fastest growing in the nation. And I'm sure it's flipped now. We're looking more at solar. And again, a reason why I'd love to look at solar as that next opportunity or battery technology as that next opportunity for Wayne. And if we have that opportunity because we've got those partnerships Wayne proper might be able to to support that more because uh, maybe they they don't need to be as rural. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> so next up is the uh, um, the, the history of our conferences. The uh, we've had I don't know how many workshops, but a lot of them have had something to do with the title that says it all begins with landowners. It not only all also begins with landowners it also ends with the absence of landowners who want to participate and so uh, for these kinds of projects it really is important uh, to have the support of landowners who want to voluntarily participate in these kinds of activities and i always like to remind folks uh, who are uh, sometimes uh, not on our side of the renewable energy discussion that we're having in our state is that uh, when you find one wind turbine in the state of Nebraska that's on property that a landowner didn't want it there and didn't sign an easement to put it there, be sure and come by the office and let me know because I want to see that. And there's never been one of those that's ever happened. These are all voluntary uh, landowner approved projects and developments. And so with us now is a, is a good friend, Don Rohde, who's uh, a Wayne County landowner. And so, uh, Don, uh, I, you know, kind of the way I think about these things, you do as you would wish, but I always kind of think about from, you know, your perspective, there had to be sort of the beginning. And then there's the, gee, the during where, you know, dramatic things are happening to your land. And then there's the after, and how has that been working? So take it away. I live up north of Carroll, <clears throat> and anyway, they were uh, fun to work with, these guys. And we knew them all, go out there and talk to them every day. 
and they tore the land up like they said, but they didn't any extra. When they put it back together, they said you could use this road anytime you wanted or at harvest time. So that's what we've been doing for this year and last year. And uh, we parked the truck out there and take the green cart. They made a beautiful road. So I love them. They're nice. It's good retirement money. And one way to get in school some tax. <laughs> so, so based on the kind of the, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, you had to have a lot of discussions at the kitchen table. Uh, talking about, gee, uh, this is this is a big, uh, this is a big project. This is a big deal. This would be a dramatic change. And so, from kind of the discussions uh, that began at the beginning, uh, have do you think about the uh, sort of the expectations you had? Are you are you satisfied with the way things have turned out? Have they kept their word? Yes, they have. They really have. And I heard the other day that there was five guys into the coffee shop in Carroll the other day. And these are guys that work mechanics and the company was gonna send them some more sales. And they got to talking with the bosses and they said, we want to stay in Carroll. We love it there. And so they left them. So that's good. And one of them lives in Norfolk, one of the guys that I've met him. Okay, Don, Rick Geyer, for the rest of you. I was the agent that met with Don many years ago, uh, representing a company called Tradewind Energy. If you remember, they became Enel Energy, who then sold the project to Orsted Energy. Through all of that transition, how were you affected? Nothing really, it all worked the same. They, Payments the same, contracts the contract. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good. Number. Oh, the other thing. I the day I met Don, I knew the first thing he wanted. You know, I think he asked me, "Could I speak in front of a large group?" Yeah. And so here, there. Yeah. The answer is yes. So have that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. yeah maybe not. So. Talk about your roads. The roads they built were really nice. They, they come out there and it's 16 foot wide, pushed a little mound of dirt up on each side. Then they dumped four inches of cement, powdered cement in there. And then they had this big old tiller. I had to go out there and drive alongside for a while. And it was eight foot wide and they were tilling this cement in, pushing the water truck up the hills, 5,000 gallons. And, and mixing this salt, and that road is hard. I got nice gravel on it. It is nice. So I think the plow's gonna have trouble getting through that if they fall over. Well, this is probably gonna be a mixed question for many of you, but I just start and write notes down here. It's like, so maybe to you, uh, and I don't, didn't catch his name, but he just sat down, that handed me the mic. I'm curious to know the planning time. I mean, you said that you joined in 2017, yeah. when you came on board, how long did this? Oh. How long has this been in the works? And I got more to my question. So, go ahead, Rick. I'll take part. Yeah, you can take part of it. Uh, Haystack itself is what I worked on, and uh, we spent three years, maybe, renting leasing ground in Stanton County. Uh, overlapped with, and, and probably leased 18,000 acres, something like that, for the potential of development. Moved to Pierce County, uh, ended up in Wayne County and built, built the entire project in Wayne County. So uh, that was, uh, well, I met Don in 19 uh, at his place. You were probably midway through the leasing, you know, we leased probably for a year prior to that. So in Wayne County. So uh, I forget how many acres altogether. It's probably around 35,000 that we leased on that project and uh, used 
two percent of the land, one percent of the land with roads and everything. So it only takes about an acre for each tower. Yeah, for about an acre. Right. Yeah. Does that pay a little more than cash rent, or is that, it? That rent's really good. The rent's good. Okay. So then I'm going to ask maybe you, John, the question because you were trying to wake up Neely. Um, I'm sure that there was opposition in the community for and against. Um, so do they see the benefits now so we can come back to you and see, okay, maybe we should change our mind. And how is your community going to, I mean, you said you had a jolt, but how many other communities could take advantage of something like this for the school districts like what we just heard here in the times when people want their taxes cut and they want to do away with things. I mean, I know I live in a community where they want to put in a, a new junior high and nobody can seem to come to an agreement. And I look at this and think, man, are we just missing out? I mean, God only knows we have some good wind here in this state, you know? So um, I, I'm just curious how other communities can get on board because I think my, I first wrote down who approached who? How did Wayne County get picked? Regulations? No regulations? Was that the start? So the, the, the start of the whole thing for Wayne County, there was a group of landowners in the early 2010s that wanted a wind project. They formed a consortium and they started soliciting wind power developers to, to look at their, their possible land as, as a good site for wind. Uh, ultimately, that group cho chose NextEra uh, they had quite a few different consultants that worked with them on that, that the group had consultants working for them. So they had to put up some cash up front as that, that landowner group. And then they selected NextEra. NextEra started coming in and saying, yeah, we're going to do this, but it's going to take us some time to get all of those land use agreements put together with the, the landowners, get the, you know, put the, the rent on paper, whatever it might be. Um, I think that group did things a little bit different. I don't know how, uh, and Rick, you can answer this about how things worked when it was trade wind siting, uh, like how the, the, the each landowner got treated if it was as a collective or if it was on an individual basis. And I think that original consortium for the Shoals project, they got treated equally. Um, I don't know if the other landowners that got in, because uh, we, don't, we don't talk about this sometimes, but I don't know if that original group was maintained throughout and how they were treated. And then if there was others that were brought in later on, if they got treated the same also. Um, and that's between that is that's sometimes proprietary between the developer and the landowners. And that's not something I'm going to ask a lot of questions about. So early 2010s and Schultz went online in late 2018. So anywhere between five and six years to, to fully uh, vet it and bring it to operations. Um, uh, uh, Shoals, the the project you spoke of, was a group of landowners, uh, 15, 18 people, I think, originally. And uh, with the idea of building wind, and it, it, it didn't take off right away. Uh, I think the presence of a couple of other companies being local and working there probably... It might have accelerated. Poked the bear a little bit, yeah. So... Uh, uh, that was the first project to be built, and those contracts I'm not very familiar with. Uh, Orsted had the Plum Creek project, which was on the southern edge of uh, uh, Wayne County. Uh, very familiar with that contract. Uh, it was very similar to, and, and the contracts, the contracts, the contract, right? So everybody, uh, Don didn't speak of this, but we asked, to be, you know, ask the landowner to not share all their information, right? Well, uh, most of that is so that we don't, I don't go talk to Don and then tell him what his neighbor's doing. So, uh, you know, it works both ways there. So all of these agreements will have a memorandum filed with the counties. And that memorandum just says that they're under wind lease with the project name, Haystack, Plum Creek, or Shoals. Uh, but the contracts are all the same. We pass out the same, same agreement to each landowner uh, in every case. So, Don, do you remember how many times we met before? About a dozen. Uh, too many? What? 
About a dozen. About like a dozen, that. yeah, might have been. So. Quite a few. I thought, I thought Don said something about you showing up so often that his dog didn't even bark when you came. He didn't. I think your dog's name is Molly. Am I right? Snowball. Oh, big white dog. We have a question. Uh, yeah. Well, I want. Can I address her opposition question too? We didn't get to that. So uh, there was opposition in Wayne County, but as we've heard in other sessions through this conference, a lot of times it's a very small, concentrated group that that uh, leads that uh, opposition charge. I think it was loudest during the Shoals project when they were finishing up their road use agreements with the Wayne County Board of Commissioners. Uh, and then after that got under under construction, it quieted down. Uh, as the other projects developed, I saw less and less opposition because it was already in place. It was not, so, I think that we're gonna try and get rid of it from the very very beginning. And once it's over the hump, they, there's not much they can do. Like, I don't know if they threw up their hands and said, we resign or if they're just quietly stewing in the background still. Um, and, and that's, and I, I don't wanna sound insensitive. I feel there was, there was two camps with opposition. It's folks that were reading some of the, the literature out there about different, you know, and we had the health guy earlier today talk about debunking some of the literature that is out there uh, in opposition to wind or other renewable projects. And then you had the cr group that I feel they were, they were frustrated because Don got asked and the other guy across the road didn't. Um, you know, it, yes, this is a, this, these are projects that create haves and have nots, but that's if, if you're willing to be a part of it from the get go and you're working with Rick and he's got 35,000 acres signed up. And then, yes, you are that 2% that actually gets picked. I'm sorry for the other 98%, but that's just how these work. They, they have good metrics to show Don's piece of property was better for wind relative to my piece of property. And then again, some of the neighbors were totally against building some around me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they even argued they wouldn't let them bury the cable under the ground. Through ours, they had to go quite a few miles to the east or west of us and then, mm -hmm. and then head south. Yep. So now all the neighbors didn't want it. Right. But let, let me to your other point there. I, I've got some my own numbers, and I, but these are American Clean Power numbers. But most of these mirror the numbers that we put together. But th this is this is one of the biggest, uh, if, if not the biggest, uh, rollout of new economic opportunity for rural Nebraska that our state has seen. And so when we look at uh, value-added opportunities, and you look at ethanol. Uh, we have over $5 billion worth of new tax base and new farm income and new good paying jobs. And, you know, it's a huge economic driver. So when you compare ethanol, which is a huge value added success story to wind, wind now has $6 billion worth of new tax base in rural Nebraska. And these are all rural Nebraska investments. And so that's new tax base, that's new capital investment. Uh, so it's $34.5 million worth of new additional farm income that comes in farmers' pockets, regardless of whether it rains or not. Don, I've heard it's a little dry in Wayne County. Um, and so uh, it's a huge plus uh, for farmers. When I drive down the road and I see a wind turbine, I look at a wind turbine and I say there is about the economic equivalent to a, a part-time job that a farmer could get in town, except he doesn't have to stop farming in order to go into town and take time away from his family and his farm to earn it. So it's, it's, it's very substantial amounts of income that's used to help pay the, the farm uh, operating costs. In a lot of cases, uh, people tell me that that really helps solidify family living costs. So it's not a minor thing. And so when you look at the new tax base, uh, what does that provide? At least $15.9 million uh, worth of, of new uh, local taxes. So these are huge economic drivers and opportunities, but like a lot of life, you know, uh, this is a self-help project. 
you need you need to make some sort of an effort in order to better your position and improve your lot. And so what we're saying is that uh, for our landowners who want to do that, we need to make sure that this kind of economic opportunity doesn't pass us by. I, we had another question. Yeah, he handed it over to me. Uh, Dave Vavre, Sling County Wind Association. We started back in 2007, we were approached by three developers and instead of letting them go one by one, we formed a window uh, landowner association. We interviewed seven different developers and then the landowners chose which developer they wanted to negotiate with. The board then went ahead and negotiated. Each one of us spent about 115 hours going through the contract with a qualified attorney. When we finally come up with the final project, we presented the, the lease agreement to the developer or to the landowners. The landowners voted by their signature whether they wanted to sign or not. In three weeks time, we had people coming into a central lodge. Uh, they came to sign. They didn't have to, uh, the guys didn't have to go out to visit the individuals. We signed over 22,000 acres in three weeks because the landowners were educated. We had no opposition until the developer we went with got out of the wind business, then it got transferred to somebody else. That guy went broke, hedge fund took it back, and then it got shifted off to another developer that didn't bother to read the lease agreement, and they were going by what they thought was their lease agreement, and we had all sorts of problems. Now, I just met with their representatives not more than a half hour ago, and we hammered out a bunch of things, but because we developed the wind association, we were able to real, rectify things that they weren't going to touch before. So uh, that's, that was our, and we've, we've got a 300 megawatt wind project turning today. So, uh, but it's a long time. And I, I, and I was surprised when you mentioned Stanton County. We went up there and did a presentation in Stanton County, and we had to have the county sheriff uh, protect us. <laughs> the, the county agent was the one that organized that. But um, if you... If you organize the landowners and educate them, you will have very little opposition. It's when things started going bad with the developer that we the opposition started showing up. So educate the landowners. And uh, I don't get paid any. I, out of my, my living room window, I see six turbines. Closest one is a half mile away, and I get no payments. So, uh, but... My wife even says, you know, those aren't so bad looking. It's kind of relaxing to watch them red lights at night. And we're going to string up green lights now at Christmas time in the windows. So they red and green lights and, and then white and blue lights in the winter, in the, in the 4th of July and, and, uh, you know, make the best out of it. So. And, oh, and the other thing is make sure that the developer covers all the insurance liabilities. Uh, that was another big issue that, we found that the, you can't buy insurance for a commercial operation uh, under your farm. But, uh, but th those were our experiences. Thank you for that. And now to try to bring this home, uh, uh, Nebraska Farmers Union uh, worked with Northeast Community College and uh, the president of the college. Uh, we had some very interesting conversations and it was my job, uh, I thought, to try to convince him that by golly, there's going to be a need for wind technicians and the Northeast Community College is going to be in the middle of all of this development and that uh, he ought to help establish a program and do that. And uh, so uh, it happened and we were fortunate enough to uh, have uh, folks who can see the future and see it coming. And uh, we helped also as a part of the advisory committee uh, when it was first getting established and going and it is just a whiz bang successful program continues to just uh, do a great job of, of turning out wind technicians across the, the state and the Midwest. And here to tell us more about it is Nate Simpson. Yeah, my name is Nathan Simpson. I am the uh, wind energy instructor at Northeast Community College in Norfolk. Um, I've been there going on seven years now and the development across our region is just exploded. I've been having a hard time keeping up with all the new development that's happened around our area. Um, I'll try to keep this short because I know you guys probably got some more questions to ask. Um, I'm actually from Wayne County. I grew up in Carroll, Nebraska, most of my life. 
or most of my young adult life. I grew up there until I was 16. Um, when I was, you know, looking for a career path to go down, I liked to work with my hands. I wanted to be a mechanic, uh, but also seeing the opportunities being an electrician. And so when I went to Northeast Community College um, as a young adult, I took both of those degrees. Um, so that's kind of what brought me back to uh, being qualified to teach wind energy. I had both those mechanical skills and those electrical skills. And like I say, looking back, growing up in Carroll, you know, when I was young, I would have never imagined to see the opportunities uh, that are growing in that area today. Um, we've got a great area, obviously. Uh, right now, the demand for wind technicians across the United States uh, is huge. That gives our technicians great opportunity to move up fast through the ranks. Um, we've had students that have graduated our program that within three to four years, they are pretty much uh, telling everybody else on these sites, you know, what to do and not even climbing towers anymore. Um, so the high demand also makes, makes those positions move a lot faster. In our program, we basically just teach them as many basics as we can. Um, we teach them how to be comfortable with climbing the towers. Uh, they're very tall, so climbing and rescue is an important part of our program. Uh, Self-rescue, usually they always work in groups of two uh, at the very minimum, but at sometimes you might have to perform rescue on yourself. Uh, recently, in the last couple of years, we've got a new nacelle donated to us from NextEra Energy. Um, this has been an awesome tool in helping our students learn how to be comfortable working outside of the nacelle um, while working at a low and safe height. Um, also repelling off the side of these. Um, if you're doing this for the first time, 250 feet in the air, it becomes a little bit daunting. So this gives our students opportunity to practice. Um, with all the new sites that we have around, we also go on site tours. We go out and tour full-size towers. Um, in my seven years, I don't think we've ever had anybody turn back around after climbing, you know, the tower, but we've had some people get a little bit white in the face as they get closer to the top. Um, we give them the mechanical skills that they need, uh, being a wind technician, and then also the electrical training. One of the, the biggest requests that I get is just making sure that these technicians can read blueprints, electrical schematics, know where to put their meters in a circuit and be able to test, test the circuits. Really, these towers are just like a, an advanced car that you have nowadays. They've got a lot of sensors in them. They've got computers that operate the tower. They've got to be able to troubleshoot and re do those repairs. Um, We've also got a tower on campus. It's not a full size megawatt size tower, but it is a 80 foot hub height tower that the students do maintenance and repair on. Um, the comparable jobs, uh, electricians, mechanics, industrial maintenance technicians, uh, electronic repair technicians and substation and utility uh, linemen. And then here's what the average wages looks like. And this is kind of what I wanted to really get to. So average across the United States is $56,260 per year. Um, that's over the installation, maintenance, and other related occupations. So right now, the demand of, for wind technicians is so great that they're getting paid you know, pretty good money to do it. Uh, I reached out to some of my techs uh, that are in Wayne County. So right now, uh, NextEra Energy, I have three previous students working there on that site. They've got four technicians, I believe, and then their site manager. And so this Tech 3, um, different sites work a little bit differently on how their tech levels work. Uh, Next era's tech levels, they you start, when you first get hired on, you start at a Tech Level 3. So that's like a, a basic uh, apprentice wind tech. Um, and this tech actually only went through our program for one year. So we offer a one-year diploma uh, with an internship and then we also offer a two-year Associate of Applied Science degree. Um, this student in the Tech 3 position, he came back to us. And he, this was our first student, actually, that has came from Wayne County. And so we were kind of happy to get him. But um, he came back to do his sophomore year for about a week. And Next Era Energy offered him pretty good money uh, in his home area to basically get uh, employed 
and also gave him a $5,000 sign-on bonus. And so this is what his base salary is. Um, the Tech 2 position, so this is a student that's also got a one-year diploma. Uh, he left the program once again. He didn't want to go into the more technical program or, or uh, <clears throat> classes that we offered. So he just hired on as well. So he has two years of actual field experience and he was, he's getting $55,000 a year. And then we have a tech one who's been out there uh, five years and has a two year degree and he's getting 65,000 a year. And then I also, so this is some technician wages by the Plum Creek wind farm. Now I didn't get a hold of any of our technicians over there. We actually have two previous students that work at this wind farm. Um, but I got hold of one of our senior lead techs who would actually be at Broken Bow 2, uh, which is also a GE site. And so he kind of broke down the salaries for me. And this is kind of what he gave me. So a maintenance tech would be the, their entry level position. Um, these guys are getting about 35,000 a year. Their wind tech position, which is a more experienced level, they're getting about 45,000 and the senior techs are 55,000. And like I said, just, Actually, he's been out in the site. Oops, sorry about that. He's been out in the field for about three and a half years, and he's right now a senior lead tech at that site, probably going to be moving into the uh, site manager position at that, at that wind farm, and uh, he's getting around 80000 a year. So, yeah, these, <clears throat> these young students that are getting employed, um, they're not having a problem right now with getting positions right around our area and in Wayne County. Um, you know, they're starting new families, they're spending money, they're buying new cars. Um, I think, you know, once again, being from Wayne County myself, I think it's an awesome opportunity that uh, has been nothing more than, than great for Wayne County. And that's all I have. Uh, that was great information. I'm looking forward to reviewing all those slides again later. Um, I was just curious if other community colleges, this sounds like a fantastic program that's obviously very successful, are other community colleges in the state or even in the region looking to you to create a similar program or does this already exist at other community colleges as well? I always had programs similar to this for a long time. Um, we kind of developed our program off of a program over uh, from Iowa. Obviously they've had the turbines in their area a lot longer. Um, from what I know, Central Community College is now starting a wind technician program as well. I'm not sure how far um, they are along. I know they've, they've had students, but I'm not sure what their enrollment, enrollment numbers are or if it's an exact similar program to what we have. But when we were in the business of trying to help get, this, get the, the community college community interested in doing this, we were also thinking you know, kind of strategically about trying to make sure that we got all the different kinds of renewable energy uh, occupations covered without having uh, a lot of redundancy where we each one had its own. And so Northeast Community College is the, is the designated leader for wind technician training. And so it's worked out very well uh, for us as a state. And so it's been a great program. Other questions? So just a, a Couple things that I wanted to share. Uh, uh, Don has got four of the new five megawatt turbines on his property, and uh, so uh, when I, uh, if you go out his south uh, door and you're kind of looking out, you've got these two turbines that are not all that far from his house, and in, in between there's a windmill that's in his farmyard. And I said, have you had any problem with noise? And he said, yeah, the windmill's kind of squeaky. Um, so <laughs> if you've ever grown up with a windmill, windmills were not quiet. I <laughs> want to tell you that. Uh, so, uh, and his experience has mirrors the experience of, of hundreds of landowners that we work with across the state through all these projects. So we've put on... Uh, I would guess somewhere around 700 public information meetings across the state of Nebraska to landowners and communities and different you know, community colleges, all different kinds of entities who are evaluating whether or not they wanted to take advantage of renewable energy opportunities. And here's the, here's the latest data, here's the pluses, here's the minuses. Um, you know, take a look at what the options are. But, you know, when the, when opportunity knocks, 
uh, you're under some obligation if you want to take advantage of the benefits is to put the welcome mat out and take advantage of those opportunities. And so uh, while there's push and pull back and forth and, and all of those things, I can't think of any community that we've worked with who made the decision uh, to go forward. When you go back and you talk to those folks after all the hubbub's over and the development is up and it's running, that would uh, not be pleased with the decision they made. They're extremely happy. And, uh, and so it's been good for farmers, it's been good for rural communities, uh, and it really says, sends a positive message uh, for, you know, for folks that yes, uh, it's important that we get informed that, and, and the Landowner Association in Saline County is a good example. You need to do your homework, but at the end of the day, uh, you need to make decisions that help improve your lot in life. And uh, when you're bringing in this much new additional income, uh, we just don't have anybody else knocking on doors in rural Nebraska saying, can we bring you a bunch of new jobs and capital investment and tax base and farm income? We just don't have that. So I'm really pleased with this panel and pleased with the decisions that they made. And I think that they're by far the better for it. And let's give this panel our uh, thanks and appreciation for all the hard work that they've done and the things that they've done. <laughs>